Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. So today I will be giving a presentation on universal connectivity with Loop P2P. Uh, the talk is titled Connecting Everything Everywhere All at Once. And so you'll, you'll I'll, sh I'll kind of show you why a little bit later. But we originally gave this talk at IPFS thing in, in 2023. So I'm repurposing the slides um, here. So this uh, workshop and this application was developed with the help of a lot of folks. So myself and, and some of the engineers and <clears throat> uh, that you see listed here all worked on this. This was a large team effort that you know required the con working with a lot of different lib P2P implementations. Um, the purpose of this workshop really is to excite you to use lib P2P in your uh, hackathon projects um, and also well after that. Uh, we're, I'm going to show you like a, a walkthrough of the current state of lib P2P, you know, where different uh, transport protocols are at their current state of implementations, um, and just give you a brief overview. Uh, I hope to like provide you with all the tools necessary to get started and jump right into your hackathon project uh, so that mainly so that you have like a strong foundation to use lib P2P. Um, and, you know, just... Thanks everybody for joining. Um, you know, I'm really happy that you're giving the Loop P2P project your attention and, and considering using it and, and participating in the open data hack. Um, and I also want to extend everybody an invite to join the broader Loop P2P open source community because we're always you know, super enthusiastic about um, you know, cultivating the open source culture. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the offer for a cup of coffee. I'll definitely be having that after the, the presentation. It's early in, in the West Coast. So yeah, what is Loop P2P, right? So maybe you guys are a little bit familiar with it, maybe not. I'll just kind of give you a brief rundown. Um, Loop P2P at its core uh, is a peer-to-peer -peer networking library. Like we like to imagine it as a toolkit um, that you know any stack can build on if they want to have a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network uh, underneath, right? Its main thing is um, it's driven by a set of specifications. So libp2p at its core is not just the networking libraries, but rather you know what people write and say what the behavior of libp2p should be. So we have a single set of specifications that define define like how different um, protocols should interoperate with one another, how they should work you know, how we evolve these protocols and all of these discussions happen in the, in the open. And at, towards the end of these slides, I'll share a link with you about the, the specs. Um, but I mean, they are also the implementations as well. We just like to say that we start from first principles and we specify things uh, at the very beginning. Um, and so, you know, we also have these implementations in a variety of different languages. I think at the current count, there's about 12 different libp2p implementations. You know, like there's Go, JavaScript, Rust, uh, NIM, C++, Kotlin. And, you know, you might be wondering, well, why are there so many different languages? Well, the main goal is we want to have an implementation in different languages so that developers are comfortable, you know, building something that in a language that they're familiar with. Um, we also want to serve like different sorts of environments. So you know, a, a one language may be suited f better for a specific execution environment. Like for instance, if you want to run in the browser, you probably want to write your application in JavaScript, right? Or maybe in Rust, compiled to Wasm, something like that. And so we want to have, a libp2p project wants to have a footprint of presence in you know, all these different ecosystems and execution environments. Um, another reason for having multiple different um, implementations is we are able to limit like a single source of failure. So uh, meaning that if there is something in one specific protocol that affects one language implementation, because you have such a variety of different implementations, you know, you have, a you can build a resilient heterogeneous network. A single bug cannot take down the entire network. Um, so the main goal is, you know, to build a peer-to-peer -peer network that's resilient to the chaos of, you know, the, the modern internet. Um, so on top of that, we also have you know, Loop P2P provides a lot of low-level features, things that are abstracted away from the user so that you 
can be, you can rest easy. So you can be assured that, you know, things are working and things are secure. So what that means is features like encryption, where, you know, any transport protocol that needs to be encrypted is, in, is encrypted so that nobody can um, uh, basically, you know, spy or, 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 you know, infer data that you're uh, uh, sending between one node to another node. Um, we also have authentication mechanisms built on, built on top of our protocols. And there are also like higher level features like hole punching, which enables peers that are behind like firewalls or NATs to be able to connect with each other. Um, and after that, there's even more like application level things that you can build on libp2p like a distributed hash table or gossiping for gossip sub. So um, this is like a, a very powerful you know, very diverse toolkit that kind of provides all this to you at your fingertips for, from day one. Um, and it's, you know, readily available in multiple languages. And so what we like to say, it's like libp2p is all you need to build peer-to-peer -peer applications. So, you know, this is how we used to present like all the different ways that libp2p could enable you to connect with one another. Um, so, you know, you see this nice, but boring table here that talks about like public, private, you know, if you're running on a browser, if you're not running on a browser, whatever, but you know, we're saying no more. Okay, we don't want to present a, a, a boring table anymore. So that's what this talk is about, is mainly about how do we connect everything everywhere all at once. So maybe you guys have seen this movie, maybe you haven't. I think it won a couple of Oscars, but this is a, a, a GIF from that movie, if you've seen it, um, there's this like concept of the multiverse there. And so my joke is like, what you're actually seeing is loop P2P connecting all the different multiverses together. So, um, you know, what, what we are gonna do now to showcase all the different ways that loop P2P can connect each other is to build a, a chat application. So the goal is to have a simple peer-to-peer -peer chat app that can demonstrate how you can connect all the browsers and on browsers, uh, how you can connect any, everywhere, like regardless of whether you're uh, public or whether you're behind a NAT or a firewall. And obviously like you wanna do that all at once. And you know, we wanna make sure that libp2p is, is the toolkit that, that's uh, enabling that. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the primary reason we built this application uh, is to showcase libp2p and the different transport interoperabilities. Um, and kind of show to you guys how, you know, these different functionalities can enable new use cases, uh, really, you know, serve developers and hackers. Um, this is like the culmination of many months work, worth of work as well. Um, you know, different lib P2P implementations were working hard to add new features like WebRTC or Web Transport into their implementations. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in the coming slides. Um, and yeah, I mean, the best way to demo all of this, of course, is not like that table that I was showing you, but rather something that's interactive, an application that people can copy and paste into, into their own hackathon project and, and, and build on top of. So having, you know, said the introduction, let me kind of give you an overview of like how connections are made between the P2P nodes and, and how that fits all into the uh, app context. And I'll give you like a short demo of me running the app on my local host as well. Um, so first, like, you know, I mentioned we have multiple implementations, right? About 12, I think, at my uh, current count. Um, what I'm showing you here is like, let's say you have two different impl implementations in Golib P2P and Rust Lib P2P. Uh, how would they connect with one another? Um, what we like to, what uh, Lib P2P implementers like to, you know, use, uh, today is a modern transport protocol called Quick. Um, Quick, what it does is it facilitates connectivity between non-browser, like public non-browser nodes. So anything that's running on your uh, well, laptop, on a server somewhere. Um, you know, I mentioned we start from specifications. So here you can see like our little specification lifecycle header. That means, uh, you know, where, that, where the spec is at its uh, lifecycle stage. Um, how mature is it? You know, here we said that Quick is recommended, meaning that we have more than one implementation that um, has implemented uh, the Quick uh, transport. 
uh, it's active, and then you know when when that spec was last revised. Uh, in Go P2P, Quick has been around for quite a long time, and support landed in Rust Loop P2P uh, in Q4 of last year. So one thing that I should definitely mention right now is that um, you know how widely deployed Loop P2P is. So it's in the Filecoin and IPFS networks. Uh, it's used in the Ethereum Beacon chain. And one thing that's interesting about Quick is the Ethereum Beacon chain when it was first written. You know, uh, as you guys know, that it's it's for the consensus layer of Ethereum. Um, it was first written so that nodes will only communicate with one another in TCP. But right now, um, different Loop P2P implementations are working with the Ethereum teams, like Prism that uses Go Loop P2P, uh, uh, Lighthouse that uses Rust Loop P2P, and so on, to actually move to Quick. Um, because in, in general, it's a better transport. It comes in with its built-in encryption and, and multiplexing, um, and it's, uh, it's great. So, you know, that's the foundation of our universal connectivity app, is like if you have two server nodes in, in Go or Rust that are running in some data center somewhere or on your personal laptop, anything that's in a non-browser context, we're going to connect them with Quick. So, um, yeah. The other thing is, uh, you know, these nodes, we libpdp enables them to hole punch uh, between two non-browsers as well. So, you know, your laptop in your personal home might be behind like some NAT or firewall, most likely, right? And so we can use that hole punching capability of libpdp to connect, um, you know, two laptops together to like something that's running that may be publicly, publicly accessible in the cloud or in, in the data center somewhere. Um, and yeah, feel free to, you know, pause anytime or, or drop a question in the chat. Uh, I can take them now or at the end. Um, so let's add a little bit of more complexity here. You know, obviously, like, not all apps are going to be isolated to running on your laptop or in a data center. Like, you know, almost everything, you know, requires a modern web app. Uh, we want to have some sort of component, some presence you know, on, on, in the browser as well. And so that's where JS Loop P2P shines, right? And so you might be wondering, okay, great, quick, you know, you can use that to connect the, the, the small topology that you see up there, but, you know, quick cannot run in the browser. Uh, and, and so what can we do to solve that? And so what we have is a, a protocol called WebRTC Direct. And so that enables uh, browsers to connect with public non-browsers. So here you see like that JS Loop P2P node is connecting to the Rust one, right? Uh, it has self-signed certificates. Uh, this was implemented in JS like uh, late last year and also in, in Rust Loop P2P late last year. Um, and WebRTC is basically, this one is a bi-directional communication between just the browser and just, you know, a standalone server node. Uh, and alternatively, we also have another transport that we support uh, in Gola P2P, and you know, kind of hint at the future web transport and in, in other implementations later. But this is kind of the corollary to WebRTC Direct, um, and it's shipped in Gola P2P. It's on by default in Kubo. Um, if you're guys familiar with uh, uh, IPFS, uh, Go IPFS is, was renamed to Kubo sometime um, in, in the last year, and so. You know, a lot of web transport kind of powers the browser to server connectivity between browser nodes and Kubo nodes as well. So, yeah, you know, here you see like multiple browsers are connected to multiple servers, right? Um, obviously, that's not the entire story. We want also peer to peer connectivity within the browser as well. And so, the way we establish that is using the WebRTC protocol. And so the WebRTC Direct is just browser to, ser uh, browser to server, but WebRTC, that is for connecting multiple browsers to one another. So essentially, it allows um, us to use different parts of the WebRTC specification, um, like signaling, um, exchanging, uh, ICE candidates. So these are all like implementation specific to WebRTC. I'm not going to go into that, but what it enables is allows browsers to hole punch, basically discover one another's public IP addresses and make connections, even though um, they're not like, you know, running locally. Um, 
So this was implemented in JSLU PDP earlier this year. Uh, you know, it, it definitely opens up the, the world of new types of applications that are purely just, you know, browser based um, that can communicate with one another that may not need uh, browser to server capabilities. And so what we like to say is like, okay, now you can kind of see like how the picture is coming together, right? We, we started off with just connectivity between servers and, you know, personal laptops, you know, by adding a little bit more like WebRTC Direct and Web Transport, we're kind of opening that up a little bit to connectivity within the browsers. And lastly, once we have WebRTC, we're able to kind of complete the picture and have connectivity between browsers, between browsers and servers, browsers and laptops, what have you. So um, recently, we're also adding web transport for the WASM environment. So as I mentioned, Rustle PDP, you can compile that down to WASM and then run some application in, in your browser as well. Um, you're, you don't need to purely rely on JS PDP. And so web transport was recently added. This was like a really great feature. It's awesome to have. Um, and it was a community contribution. So that's another thing that I wanna highlight. It's not just the implementers that are working on this, but also the community. Um, and what's next for Loop P2P and all these you know, fancy transports? Well, we're adding WebRTC Direct uh, into Go Loop P2P. Right now, those browser to server communications can only happen between um, nodes using web transport. Um, Firefox is adding support for web transport. So that's another, um, you know, since it's such a new bleeding edge protocol, not all modern browsers support it. So Firefox is adding support. Uh, uh, and then Apple and Safari may be doing that in the near future as well. Uh, just like we had web transport for the WASM environment, we're also adding WebRTC another for the WASM environment, which is another community contribution. Um, and eventually there will be like native web transport support, uh, meaning that, you know, just because it's supported in the WASM environment doesn't mean you can use web transport like um, in, in, your, in your laptop or something. Um, so that's going to be coming soon. And that browser to private component, which is the browser to browser that I was mentioning, that's also going to be added. Um, yeah, and then emoji support to our chat app feature uh, to travel universes, like I mentioned uh, in the movie, and different implementations like Zig will also be adding it. Um, so let me stop sh uh, sharing the slides and share my um, entire screen so that we can kind of Take a look at how this chat app functions. In the question channel from Slavic, who says, with okay. lib P2P, is it possible to get through the DPI, deep packet inspection firewalls? Yes, yes. So you, you can definitely use the whole punching mechanism to, to get, uh, get around firewalls. Um, and I can share the link to the documentation that kind of describes what hole punching looks like, how it works, uh, as well as the specifications if you're interested. Was this in the chat here or somewhere else? So you'll see at the bottom we have a chat uh, channel and we also have a questions channel as well. Um, I'm happy to shout out those if, if you can't see them. Yeah, um, sounds good. So what I'm doing here right now in, in, in terms of the demo, can you see my uh, terminal? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, let me know if I need to make the text a little bit bigger. But what I did just now is I launched um, the Rust libpdp peer. Um, so just using the cargo run command, it runs the Rust libpdp WebRTC peer. Uh, you can see this is its multi-address. So this is this is the address it's listening on. Um, and the way the multi-address is composed, you can kind of get a sense of uh, what transport protocol it's using. So here it's using WebRTC Direct. Um, here it's using Quick uh, to establish, you know, either a WebRTC or a Quick connection. So what I'm going to do next is launch the front end. Um, so I'm just going to do npm run dev. Go to localhost. And let me open a new incognito window. Okay, so this is the local instance of the browser application of the chat application that's running. So what it does internally is it has the Rust peers multi-address set up as a bootstrap node. So what that means is when this app first launches, it's going to connect to that Rust peer. And so you can see it's multi-address. It's saying, hey, I'm connected to peer 
that ends in L5 TS3. And we can, we can see that this guy's multi-address ends in L5 TS3. And you can like see from some of the logs here as well that it's connected there. Um, and so if we go to the chat window, you can see, you can say, hey. Um, and you can see here that it received the message, hey. Uh, so what the Rust peer will also do is it'll periodically send like messages to the browser application. So it's saying, hey, um, hello world sent from the Rust peer at like 150 seconds or something like that. Um, so that's a demonstration of the WebRTC browser to server transport uh, working. What I'm going to do next is show you like the connection, connections between uh, Rust and Golu P2P using Quick. Um, and so to do that, what I'll first do is I'll copy the Quick multi address here and go to the Go Peer tab and then Go Peer dash dash connect. I'm going to paste in the Rust Peer's Quick multi address. Um, and cool, you can see DL5TS3 is connected and it also received a hello world from the Rust peer at 195 seconds. Um, and from this is like a fancy chat window for the Go peer. Uh, and you can see that its peer ID ends in ENGS. It's listening on these quick addresses, which is how it was able to connect with the Rust peer. And it also has a web transport address that it's listening on. So this would enable browser to server connectivity between uh, a browser JS loop PDP node and a uh, and 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 any Go peer supporting web transport such as this one. So I'm going to copy this and go here. And with this functionality, I can actually copy and paste the multi address. Um, I think type here. So connect. Yeah, cool. And you can see here. Um, the connected peers list updated, and we can see that we connected to ENGS using web transport. If we go back here, we can see uh, QUW4, that was our browser peer, and we also connected to that guy using web transport. And so if we go back to the chat, we can say, hey, from the browser, you can see, hey, from the browser came through, and then I can go here and say, hello, from the Go peer. Um, and you can see hello from the Go peer came through from ENGS around the same time that the hello world from the Rust came through. Um, and what I'll do next is, oops, I'll create more instances of the browser application. And what you can see here is like they'll first connect to the bootstrap node and you'll see like other connections happening as well and so what's happening here uh when it's connecting u9 and h3 is that it's making a web rtc connection so these are the browser to browser connections that i was talking about um so that's all uh this is basically a de decomposition of the different protocols uh each node that it's connected to um, speaks and so these are the web rtc browser to browser connections and so we can go to the chat on all of these guys. We can say like, let me make sure I'm have the chat open for all of them. Hey, hey, you know, you can see like the hey, hey coming through. Um, what's up, GM? Yeah. So you can see like they're all basically uh, speaking to one another through the different transport protocols. Um, how like how peer discovery and all that happens is is in the universal connectivity app. So we use uh, the DHT to discover peers. We use Gossip Sub to actually send messages from one peer to another. Um, but basically, this is the demonstration of kind of what's possible with these different transports. Um, you know, connecting a, a Rust node to a Go node using Quick, connecting a Go node to a browser using Web Transport. And then launching the browser in the uh, in the in, in in here and connecting to both of those either using uh, WebRTC or you know WebRTC Direct or Web Transport. So you know this is the this is the kind of the possibility that loop P2P provides. Um, let me go back to my slides real quick. 
just to give you a heads up we do have a minute or two left um i hate sure. to rush you but just to let you yeah know, yeah please. no worries um yeah just wrapping up you know i want to shout out to the community you know when when we first built this uh, universal connectivity app its purpose was to you know show hackers like you guys and developers the possibilities and like i said give you a foundation to build on and you know different community members in either you know because they were motivated inspired have contributed um, either as a part of a hackathon or not as a part of a hackathon. So you see like Doug Anderson and, and Young Jun Lee. Uh, who, Young Jun was part of a previous Hackafest and he added like a file sharing capabilities. And so shout out to them. We hope that, you know, if you guys are similarly inspired that you'll make con contributions back to this app as well. Um, and to learn more, you can always go to the repo for this app, Universal Connectivity. And then we have different websites that have a lot of resources. So I'll share these links with you in the chat as well. Um, so with that, I think that's it. I'll stop sharing my screen and- Amazing. Hope, hope you well, guys had an... Sorry, yeah, I was just gonna say thank you very much. Um, I'm sure everybody really enjoyed that one, particularly all of your diagrams and, and yeah, it's extremely useful. So um, I have noticed one question, which I hope we can sneak in really quickly. Um, and that's just, if you have any ideas of any cool projects, which you'd like to be see, uh, which you'd like to see being built as part of this hackathon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a lot of cool things. We'd I'd love to see like, uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with like Noster or something like that. If we can uh, build Noster on top of libp2p, you know, something like that. Uh, it, it shouldn't be like that difficult. And, you know, I'd love to chat with folks about it. If you guys want to talk about that, that's something. If you want to add uh, integration between the universal connectivity app and something like Helia, um, you know, that would be also really cool. Right now we added that file transfer functionality using the request response, but I'd love to see someone make that, you know, next, um, next level integration as well. Um, so hit me up. I'm on uh, discord. Uh, happy to answer any questions for you guys. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've dropped the uh, discord link in the chat. So obviously I'd recommend to everybody that you reach out there and also feel free to recap on this recording when that goes live tomorrow as well. So yeah, on behalf of everybody, uh, Prithvi, I'd just love to say thank you so much um, one last time for a really great session. And hopefully we can keep in touch with everybody over on the Discord channel or elsewhere. So, yeah, thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see you soon.